Welcome to the Star of Grind. Hey, let me introduce um, Adam Lashinsky. Adam, uh, we are so fortunate to have him here tonight. And uh, Adam is a senior editor of Fortune. He, he's the author of Inside Apple. He's written about basically every major company here in the Valley, um, from HP to Oracle to Twitter to uh, obviously Apple, Google. Um, he has uh, previously to Fortune, he was at uh, the San Jose Mercury News in the street. And uh, it's a pleasure to have him here tonight. Let's give him a big start, Brian. Welcome, Adam Lashinsky. Here we go. Welcome. Thank you. I don't have to tell you to. I know you're good at speaking into mic, so we will. Uh, uh, thanks. Please, please uh, speak in if you can. Welcome to uh, welcome to the start of Grind, all the way from. San Francisco? All the way from Petrero Hill. Okay, wow. Um, well, to get started, we always like to, to just kind of find out a little bit about uh, a little bit about our speakers. Uh, so uh, I know you're, you, uh, you hail, from, hail from Chicago. Tell us a little bit about growing up in Chicago and tell us a little bit about, about your family and, and your parents and your sisters. Okay, I um, was born and raised in a suburb of Chicago called Skokie. It's uh, most famous for where the uh, American Nazi Party tried marching in 1978 or 79. I'm forgetting wow. now. To, sure, uh, to no, try to well, piss off all the um, retired uh, uh, Jews who were co uh, concentration camp survivors, which was really nice of them. And uh, they didn't, and they didn't end up marching in Skokie. They only marched in the movie in the Blues Brothers instead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear the whole thing there, but that's okay. <laughs> um, let's see. You asked me about my parents. My uh, my father is from Omaha, Nebraska, and is a retired corporate economist. He worked for a steel company for uh, almost 30 years. When I was a little boy and I would visit him at his office in, in the Loop in Chicago, people would look at me strangely and say, are you going to be an economist too someday? And uh, I had, because they thought he was strange as the economist at, at, at a company. My mother who passed away five years ago, right before my, right after my, my five-year-old daughter was born, uh, uh, raised three children. My two, sis I have a sister in London and another sister in New York. All right. Better? Too low? How's that? Great. Thanks. Okay, so you, so you didn't become an economist, but you uh, you went to school in Illinois, and was your plan basically from the beginning was it to become a journalist? What 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 was your thought? What did you want to be when you grew up? Um, no, it wasn't my plan. I was a, a pol political science and then history major and uh, was headed toward uh, going to law school. I met a, a lot of miserable law students and decided that I didn't really want to be a, a, a law student or a, or a lawyer. And I got really lucky toward the end of college, the summer before my senior year in college, I was dating a girl who worked for the Daily Illini, the very fine student newspaper at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And I contributed some political columns from Washington where I was doing a summer internship with a congressional caucus. And I really liked seeing my name in the newspaper. <laughs> and I talked my way into a, um, into a regular column the following, following semester. Awesome. Really enjoyed that. Thought that I wanted to be uh, William Sapphire at the New York Times, if anybody remembers who he, who he was. And I, it, it dawned on me that the New York Times would not be giving me a, col a column the following year when I graduated from college. So spring term, I became a reporter for the paper, and I would take any assignment that the editors would give me. Hmm. I was older than the editors, and so I could, I could, uh, I could do what I you wanted. You could get around. And, um, and I fell in love. I found my calling as a journalist. What were you writing about initially? I mean, was it, uh, you know, tell us what were some of your big... <laughs> Your big, uh, what were the, the stories that got the most page views back then? <laughs> yeah, thank you for pointing out my age, since there weren't there weren't page views at the time, I didn't obviously. Know that. Yeah. Um, so my column was about politics, both campus politics, national politics, international politics. My news coverage, because I was hungry for bylines. That's the way journalists think. You want more bylines, more clips to show future employers. I covered a protest at the local dry cleaner because the uh, animal rights activists were upset that they were storing fur coats. 
I covered uh, telephone company rate commission hearings. I covered the uh, a very controversial topic, which was an effort by the uh, federal government to close a local Air Force base. Hmm. I went to Washington to cover that and also a women's right, a women's march for equality on Capitol Hill. Wow. I took everything I could get. Wow. And did you, I mean, did you have a, did you, did you have a love for tech? Did you have a love for, you know, was that something that materialized later or was that something, you know, did you guys... You know, grow up with a computer in the home, or no, or? Uh, no, I'm I'm not a I, to this day I'm not a techie per per se. I um, I took a handful of business classes in college because my father it, it really insisted that I that I do. So I took a, I took a couple econ classes, an accounting class, a finance class. Mm -hmm. So I graduated with uh, the the lingo of business, being comfortable with the lingo of business. I went to Washington because I was interested in politics. But the mm -hmm. first job I got was in business journalism. And so I just became a business journal, a, 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 a business generalist mm -hmm. over the first 10 or so years of my career. I did cover technology in Chicago, mm -hmm. which when I applied for a job at the San Jose Mercury News, they said, but you cover technology in Chicago. What is that, what is that good for? Not much, but I talked my way into, into the job at the San Jose Mercury News. And I always build myself as, as a business journalist covering the technology industry, hmm. not a technology journalist covering the technology industry. That turned out to be really useful when I started this tech stocks column at the Mercury News in 97 because really all the emphasis had been on technology. Hmm. And I showed up in the offices of analysts, investment bankers, chief financial officers, who were delighted to see somebody from the Mercury, Mercury News who gave a shit about finance. Yeah. Because everybody else wanted to talk about all the these other important topics sure. that weren't my topic. And, uh, I mean, was that, you know, so, you, so that was a really fresh take. I mean, it, you know, we think that was 97, you said, that you, that you got to the San Jose as Mercury? The, as the first bubble was inflating, yeah. yeah. And, and the year that Steve Jobs came back came to back. Apple. And you talk, talk about before you got to the, at the Mercury, you were actually, you spent time in Tokyo. You said earlier you spent time in Washington, D.C. Tell us a little bit about what you were doing there and what your experience was there. In Tokyo? Yeah. I, I was a, uh, a, a recipient of, of, of a fellowship from the Henry Luce Scholars Program, which sends a group of young Americans, young being under the age of 30, but college graduates, to Asia for one academic year, even though it's not an academic fellowship. It's a work fellowship. Uh, and the only requirement other than the age n is that you not have any significant Asia experience hmm. before winning. And they want they wanted to send a, each year a group of it's still ongoing, a group of promising by their definition, young Americans to experience Asia hmm. uh, started 30 years ago on the assumption that not enough Americans knew enough about Asia. So I, uh, they wow. found me a position at the Nikkei Weekly, which is the English language weekly edition of the Nihon Keizai Shimbun, which is Japan's Wall Street Journal. I hung out with a bunch of Japanese journalists and wrote some stories as best I could since I didn't speak Japanese very well and traveled you around. You wrote in Japanese or they translated them? Did you write in Japanese? No, it was an English language weekly, so I wrote, okay. in, I wrote in English and uh, traveled all over Japan, traveled all, all over Asia, drank a lot of beer and ate a lot of noodles. Awesome. Um, t t let's talk a little bit about about journalism, and uh, clearly, it's something you, you, as you've said, you kind of almost fell into it. Um, but but, uh, what about your profession, and what about being a journalist? Do you really love what? T tell us a little, and and also tell us what what makes for a great writer. Um, you know, is it is that something that you can, you know, that you can kind of check boxes on? Is that something? Is it different all across the board? So if you ask any professional journalist if they identify as a writer or as a reporter, most will be able to answer that question one way or the other. I, they'll either say, so, so for the first 15 or so years of my career, I would have told you I was a reporter. What I loved was going out, meeting people, talking to them, hearing their stories, synthesizing their stories, networking, putting people together, piecing together the story, and so on. And I was a, I was a news guy for the beginning of my career. When I got to Fortune, Fortune values writers, people mm. who can craft stories. And I was already in my 30s at that point. And I worked really hard at becoming a writer. I've come to appreciate the value of, of writing long-form narrative stories. It did not come naturally to me. I'm really proud of my writing uh, uh, today, but it's, it's something that I worked at the way you know, you hear even gifted professional golfers work for hours at their swing. I, I worked really hard at my 
style as a writer. You asked me what I love about being a journalist. It's it's those it's really the reporting that I love, and I, I you know no day no two days are the same for me. I don't spend all, I don't spend all day any day in the office. Some days I'm in the office. Most days I'm not. Uh, I love being out talking to people. How how has how have the cycles changed in the last twenty years? From you know it's easy for us to recognize what's happening today. This twenty four hour news cycle and with tech, you know it's like even in the the three years that that uh, since I left my uh, corporate job at EA, you know, it has sped up dramatically since then. Tell us, what, uh, looking back 15, 10, 15 years, how has, uh, how has technology and how it's been reported, how has it morphed and changed? So I'm not, a, I'm not the best one to ask, and, and here's why. So when I worked at thestreet.com, uh, which was focused on the stock market, uh, I tended not to watch CNBC. Yeah. I didn't like CNBC. I, I, and I don't object to CNBC per se, but I didn't want to watch CNBC because I found that it polluted my thinking and I didn't need all that noise. If I had all that noise, how was I going to do my own thing and come up with my own ideas? So similarly today, um, I'm not a habitual reader of the tech blogs, for example. Of course I see, I see things. But it's not my it's not my destination um, because I feel I, I read a lot of things. Yeah, what I read happens to be fairly traditional, but I don't feel like I need to know every little thing because if I know every little thing, it's going to be crowding out my own ability to analyze and th- synthesize and come up with the really important things. Yeah. So to me, yes, I understand that things have sped up, but. I, I think it's n- I, I think it there's a um, uh, I think it's something of a pendulum. I think the pendulum swings, and I think it will continue to swing. You know, before there were blogs, there were newsletter writers. Sure. Some crackpot, everything from some crackpot cranking out something in his basement on some conspiracy theory, up to people writing you know really valuable newsletters about say the stock market for thousands of dollars a month, and everything in between. Blogs replace newsletters. There's really high quality blogs. There's really low quality blogs. There's really high quality journalism, and there's crap journalism. And my point is, there always has been. Yeah. What uh, you know, in terms of print media, um, you know, do you think our grandkids will know what magazines are? What What is your take on you know the evolution of the magazine? Pro- pro- they they probably won't because you know print probably isn't going to be around. Um, at some point when when our grandchildren are are consuming the news or consuming print you know uh, information and you know I, I personally have gone from being upset about that to uh you know, to what, what's it the 12 stages of denial <laughs> uh, only I, I think it's a happier ending than that i don't think information is and storytelling are dying um, and so we, we really, sh- we professionals get really hung up on what well, print or digital or broadcast. And I've come to, I've come to understand that I don't really care about that. I, I, I'm really confident that people are going to continue to want high quality journalism. Yeah. And I'm, you know, somewhat confident or resigned to the fact that the, that the smart people on the business side will figure out how to sell it. And they'll keep, you know, they'll keep paying me to create it. What publications do you read? Do you respect outside of your own? So as I said, I'm I'm really traditional in my in my in my appetites. You know, I read every morning. The on, Onion on a good morning. I love The Onion. I, I'm not a regular, but I, that they're awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I no sarcasm there. I read, but every morning I read the San Francisco Chronicle, the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times in print. I love to then go to their websites and send out stories, whether to friends or on Twitter or on Facebook that I read. So I like I like grazing, you know, both both ways, if you will. And you know, for fun, for my own enjoyment, I read uh, I read the New Yorker and Vanity Fair, and I get the Economist, which I think is phenomenal, and so on. I, like I said, I'm I'm personally very traditional in my media tastes, and I and and I am I, I believe more than ever. That I like reading newspapers. Now, if newspapers go away, I'll I'll um I'll survive. You know, I'll suffer through it. Save some old ones and just. I've saved of... some. Yeah, I have. Um, it's funny, actually. You mentioned that. I, I actually I, I remember. I mean, Sunday morning as a kid, that was like that was a highlight of the week, right? Was getting a newspaper, 
sitting down and just kind of going through it or, or, you know, I just thinking about, I mean, that was, you know, when I was, you know, that was 10, 15 years ago, 15, yeah, big, not big, 10, but 15. Yeah. Big yeah. deal around my house. Absolutely. Was, yeah. you know, I can sort of, you know, this sounds sort of corny, but I can, you know, I can smell the coffee and, and taste the bagels with lox and cream cheese and the Sunday paper and classical music playing. I mean, that was our Sunday morning routine as a family. Yeah. Um, so uh, let me just make one quick announcement I forgot to make. Um, can I grab that from you, Erica? So we've got, we've got uh, a couple of books uh, that we're going to be giving away to uh, some of the people on, uh, on, on Twitter. Uh, so at Startup Grind and, uh, and also put at Ring Central in there. We've got some books here that Adam's already signed. So take pictures, uh, tweet out some of the things that you're – and please tag Adam as well in there. Um, big thanks to Don. What happened to Don? He, he just went on a goose chase and got this drink. Can we just give Don a real round of applause yeah, here real quick? Thank you, Don. What he's doing. Oh, there you are right there. I can't see you. Sorry. Um, so uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, talk to us a little bit about Inside Apple. Um, this is a really f absolutely fascinating book. And, um, uh, you know, a Apple has, has had so much, had kind of so much press at the end of the year and then into the beginning of the year. And there, as I was reading it, I was just, uh, it was so, it was so valuable to me to just kind of talk, listen to some of these lessons and go through them again. And, uh, and that's really why, why we wanted to have you, uh, have you here, and we're so excited to have you. Um, but t talk to us a little bit about just the process of, of, of coming up with the idea. Uh, where did it come from, and, and how did that all kind of materialize? Sure. So, uh, and I'll try, to, I'll try to be concise, and you can, uh, you can guide me if I'm saying too little or too much on this, because this is my life's work for the past year and a half or so. So I'm, it's something that I'm passionate about and excited about. The genesis of, the, well, there's a couple different genesises if that's a word, of, of, of this book. The, the first is, I was never the Apple guy for Fortune. Other people were the Apple guys yeah. and gals. And uh, for a variety of reasons, in 2008, uh, my editor, one of my editors, wanted to, said to me, well, and this was during one of Steve Jobs' illnesses and, or, or medical leaves. He said, well, if, if Steve were to not make it, who would be the next CEO of Apple? And I said, well, you know, that's, obviously it would be Tim Cook. He said, well, why is it so obvious I've never heard of that guy? Mm. I said, well, that's, that's a good story if you've never heard of that guy. So I did a profile in 2008. The cover story in Fortune was called The Genius Behind Steve, uh, Meet the Operations Whiz Who Could Be the Next CEO of Apple. And I quoted people and at the, who said, and it was a widely held opinion at the time, yeah. no way is Tim Cook going to be the next CEO of Apple. Not that guy. <laughs> He's so different from Steve Jobs in so many ways. So that was a really interesting story. I, the, the well, that's from some sources. You're saying you you got both sides. You got this. well. I believed from from focusing on this on, on what was going on at Apple uh -huh. and talking to Apple people that he absolutely was going to be the CEO. It was obvious to me at at the time. Hmm. You talk to people at the time, they would tell you, well, Tim's already running the company, with the exception of the things that Steve does. Sure. And that was my first big Apple story, and that kind of made me the Apple guy. And since then, I've only, well, including the one that's on the newsstands right now, I've only done three since. One was when we made Steve Jobs CEO of the decade. I did that story. And then a year ago, uh, I did a story in the magazine called Inside Apple. And our the working title was How Apple Works. The operating uh, idea behind the story, and this started with one of my editors as well, was you know, we know everything about, we think we know everything about Apple. We know about its products. But, but what do we know about how this amazing, successful, phenomenal company actually operates? Well, not much. Why? Because they won't tell us. Hmm. Now, half a step back, the, this grew out of a meeting that Steve Jobs did with a bunch of Time Inc. editors in New York where they got to talking and he said, you know, we don't have committees at Apple. We don't believe in committees. And we, we behave like a startup. And my editor, Andy Serwer, the editor of Fortune Magazine, said, oh, really? That's interesting. Tell us more about that. And he did. You know, he talked about it a little bit. And he, Andy said, we'd love to do that story. And Steve said, yeah, you know, maybe we will, which was his way of saying no. That was his, 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 his brush off. And Andy didn't forget that. And Andy said to me, that's our story. Let's do that story. Hmm. That was the genesis, and that's what I spent a lot of time on, first doing that story in Fortune. And we, you know, we can talk about what was in that story. There were a whole bunch of things that were well-known in the community of Apple employees that had never been reported before. Huh. 
the DRI, the top 100, the VP and the janitor. That's, that's where the top 100 came out. Yeah. I didn't realize that. And, and, and then, you know, very shortly after that article appeared, I, 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 sold, I sold it as a book. Okay. And so t- talk, to us, to, uh, talk to us a little bit about the process of creating the book. I mean, in terms of the, uh, some of the logistics of that. Like, so you, you, you have this great success with the story. It's, it's widely liked. It's, you know, it's a topic people are more interested in, he- in hearing more about. Um, you decide, I'm going to write a book. Then what? What's the, what happens the next morning? <laughs> it almost was like that. Um, and I'll just, just by way of interest, I'll take a half a step back. We did an experiment with this story. We knew it was going to be a hot story, and so we didn't put it on our website. Hmm. And uh, we also created it as an, as an, uh, an e-single um, for download at, or something at, at Amazon, yeah, uh-huh. for, for for purchase. And I'm I'm forgetting the exact lingo because at Amazon there's a difference between a Kindle single and an e-single. Kindle single is an original work of art uh, uh, of art, so I think this was an e-single, and we sold it for um, I think 99 cents. Okay. And um, it, it was an interesting experiment. It was successful, but people were very frustrated that they couldn't get it for free, which we were amused by. Um, <laughs> and we were frustrated too that they were frustrated and all that. But that's not what you asked me about. Um, we, um, my editor uh, at my publisher, at my publishing house, and I agreed that we needed to move quickly. We knew Walter Isaacson's book was coming out, and we didn't want to lag his book by a whole lot. Yeah. At the time, this was in June of 2011, Walter Isaacson's book was scheduled for March of 2012. Wow. People forget that. And so we hoped to beat him to market. Yeah. Uh, we also knew, and, and that's the that I want to be clear. That was the primary reason behind the timing. Mm. Secondary reason for the timing was, you know, we knew Steve Jobs wasn't going to live forever. We had no idea what the timetable what the was. timetable would be, and, and very few people did. Right down to the point where even in, a lot of people deluded themselves in retrospect and thinking when he resigned in August of last year that he wasn't go, that he was going to live a lot longer sure. than six weeks. Um, anyway, but we, but we knew it would be a good idea to move faster rather than slower. So um, I spent some period of that of last summer doing additional reporting, some period of last summer tending to Fortune Brainstorm Tech, which is the conference that I co-run at Fortune, and then um, some period of time on vacation, which was very stressful being on vacation on the East Coast, knowing that this was hanging over me. And then I took off the month of September uh, last year and wrote a rough draft of the book, and I spent the next several months revising it. And 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 so you, had you done all of your research and all of your interviews primarily before that? Before well, as I said, I, I took work that I had. Yes, I and but I really kept reporting while I was writing because of the because of the time sensitivity. I kept gathering more information, and buttressing how, things I'd already done. How many people? Did you interview? I don't know the answer, and I, I have to. I guess I should. I don't. I haven't had a spare moment to sit down and count, but I need to do that. It was, you know, dozens. Yeah, and do you know how how many hours have you have you figured that out? How many hours? No. Hun- hundreds, thousands. Well, you could do the math. You, you could help me. There's probably a, a mathematician or an engineer in the room. I mean, I spent, um, you know, from about mid July through the end of the year you know i spent most of most 40 hour work weeks on it and then it's i've taken a lot of times since the book was done uh, going out and promoting it yeah and and did you um in terms of that first draft that you had how different you know on a percentage basis was the first draft versus the version that we've read um uh, about consistent with with the magazine article the, the essence of what you read is is what i filed on the first day but it was missing things yeah. And it was missing whole chapters, and it was missing parts of chapters, and and everything in it uh, became 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 better. My editor, whose name is John Brody, who was an editor at Fortune Magazine, is a fantastic book editor, and he's a he's a collabor a collaborator and a friend, and he knows when he reads the book which parts he was responsible for. <laughs> did uh, and so do I. Do you have a specific when you, when you actually sit down to write? Um, do you have a specific pattern that you follow? Um, in terms of either your book writing or, or also just your uh, your uh, magazine writing, do you do you write in the morning? Do you you know write you know with your cell phone off? Is there are there specific mm. things that you do? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, first I first I procrastinate and and um, 
<laughs> I heard a, you know, a real giant in the writing field speak last week. Aaron Sorkin talked about the same thing. He said the beginning of the writing process doesn't look like writing. It looks like watching college sports on TV. <laughs> and uh, I, can, I can really relate to that. Now, I didn't have a lot of time in this book to mess around. So sure. I got down to business pretty quickly. And what I did, I have a... Um, there's a university library near where I live that has uh, high-speed internet and a pub uh, with food and, and coffee. I don't mean, I, I, yeah, I would have an occasional beer, but more of the fact that there's food and, and, and drinks to be had. And my gym is nearby. So when I wasn't going to work at Fortune, I would go to this library all day. And I would take time out to eat and work out, and otherwise, that was my way of not having of not not having the distractions of the office or my home. Did you write in the pub or in the club or not anything? much? I mostly wrote in the library. Okay, and and late at night. And did you write it on a MacBook or a PC? I wrote I wrote this book on a. It's not. It's, I'm not embarrassed to tell you I wrote this book on a, on an HP Latitude laptop. Awesome. Um, you don't want to know why? Go tell us why. It's my work issued. It's my work issued computer, and uh, it's smaller than my MacBook Pro, and so it's easier to carry around. T tell us. Uh, <laughs> I know I threw you with that, didn't I? <laughs> well, I mean that's that's. Did they know that? Do people ask? I mean, do the people? Yeah, Apple, some people know. Some some fanboys are really pissed off about that. <laughs> <laughs> As eight people walk out. Um, <laughs> We want refunds. Um, so t tell us a little bit. Let's talk about let's talk about the internal secrecy of, of Apple. Um, you know, I thought one really interesting comment I thought that I had never heard before uh, was how some of the meetings began with, if you you know, with the employees, if you say anything about what we're about to talk about, you will be fired and you will be prosecuted. You're referring to the uh, new employee orientation security briefing that happens uh, for all new employees uh, every Monday at, 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 on the Apple campus. And um, yeah, the uh, security secrecy is, is an important part of the Apple culture. It's an important part of the way of doing things at Apple. And so, yeah, it's, 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 not, not, it's not left to the new employee's imagination what the repercussions will be for divulging secrets. And you know, Apple people are really good at it. They they don't just sort of keep things close to the vest. They sure. totally keep things close to the vest to the point where they're hesitant to talk to their. It's obnoxious to talk to them to that. Yeah, point. it's right, right. Which which and you know, and I sort of I've written about this and I analyze it in as non-judgmental a way as I can. You, I, I I don't disagree with you that it's obnoxious, but I I, I respect them sure. for it. Like. If, if I'm not going to talk about my work, then I'm not going to talk about my work. That's right. the Apple mindset. Right. Have, have it, uh, that line, and we've got a couple of Apple guys in here. Do you remember that line from the orientation? Was that when did they, you do, raising your hands? Yeah, you remember it. Okay. Can't talk about it. Somebody Can't said. talk about it. I will not talk about that. You don't work at Apple anymore, Alex or Spencer. Um, so, but how, how is it successful at Apple? How does it seem to, you know, how does it seem to work? Uh, how do they get, you know, what is the psychology of that? Is it, you know, I don't want to say, is it indoctrination? I mean, is it, is it fear? Is it, what, what is it that drives people to keep that oath from their, uh, you know, new orientation meeting? Well, I think it's all of those things um, in, in, in different measures at, at different times. So uh, metaphorically speaking, you can, it's not unfair to compare Apple to a, um, to a military organization or to a religious institution, it has it has a hierarchy, it has rules, it has a very strong sense of mission, and it has tremendous um, it has a tremendous sense of accomplishment. So people uh, dream about working at Apple, and once you're there, if you're successful, if you're not successful, you'll be gone pretty quickly. But if once you're there, you sort of see the evidence of your success and you see reasons for being proud of your accomplishments and so you know you 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 buy in and it's it's voluntary obviously right it's a free country no one is forcing you to go to work there so there was it's an honor to it's almost like an honor to work there right very much so so you know and look the the they the Apple people get uh, the Apple PR apparatuses gets gets uh, uh, very upset with me. Not upset, they get annoyed when I liken the company to a terrorist organization or to a, a resistance cell. I didn't originate either one of those, but all of these things are metaphors. Uh, but but if you think about them, the people in these secretive organizations believe 
that's the that's the that's the initial premise they believe so you say well how is it how does it how is it successful well because they are believers it works. Yeah. yeah if they weren't if this if they saw this as a job then it would be a lot harder um I mean, with that, how in the, you know, well, uh, I'm going to, we'll come back to that. Tell, tell us about the top 100 and um, how did you, t- tell us what it is and then tell us how in the world uh, you were able to, you know, how did you get that out? How, how did that just come out? And how were you able to break that story, basically? So, um, you know, it's, it's, I try to make the top 100 as dramatic as possible because I think it is dramatic. Uh, you, someone could say, look, Dude, it's a corporate offsite, right? Okay, true. <laughs> it's it's a high level corporate offsite, but what it is is when when Steve Jobs was alive, he would select approximately the top 100 people in the company by his definition of the top 100 most important people, not according to their rank necessarily, and and there would be hurt feelings if if you were did it include- cause people to leave. I'm sorry. You talk about that that it, it caused hurt feelings, but did it was it so bad that people would leave? The no, company well, no, time? but it would. You know, p- people in corporations get upset about about being included in something, not being included in something, getting an assignment, not getting an assignment. Sure. I, he knew and he wanted you to be upset if you were at this year's top 100 and not next year's top 100. Uh, there was a reason why Steve excluded you, and that's not good. But generally, this is very high level. Um, it would be, uh, a, a, you know, they, they would go to uh, one of a couple of resorts in the Carmel or Monterey Bay uh, area, and uh, they would have presentations by Steve Jobs and other Apple executives and a few outsiders over the years um, about what was coming down the pike at Apple. Now, this was important because for such a secretive company, generally a very few people would know about all of the products that were coming down the pike. The top 100 meeting would be an opportunity for the executive management team to show a, a larger group of still very senior people things like the iPod for the first time, the iPhone for the first time, and, and so on. And it was an opportunity for people who didn't ordinarily work with each other to meet each other. The secrecy was extreme. Uh, Steve wanted people to take buses down from Cupertino, not to drive themselves. Uh, He didn't want people putting it on their calendar. He didn't want people doing email or making phone calls from the event, which of course they did because they're very busy Apple executives. They're they're going to do that. They swept the room for for bugs to make sure that that no one that this that the competition wasn't spying, and like they would with like a like a security force yes, would come in and sweep the yes. dogs and stuff. Or? I don't know about dogs, but whatever the state of the would art would have been a better is, sweep if, with dogs. If, if dogs are state of the art, then they then they would have used it. And I do know that at the last Some top one hundred that that Steve Jobs was alive for, he w- re- he uh, pr- prohibited. Uh, conversations to go on while food servers were in the room hmm. because those food servers you know could be a Samsung a, a executive <laughs> in a you know in, in a in a server's uniform I um I, I found out about it the same way I found out about everything else in the book by by uh, interviewing people and talking about it I'm sure the first time somebody mentioned it to me they they assumed that it wasn't particularly interesting or um, or, or, you know, they, they assumed that it was known, yeah. but I knew it wasn't. And once I had that kernel of information, I was able to ask other people, hey, uh, what's this top 100 thing? And they say, oh, that's blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that, 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 like that. Um, it, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it seems it's, it's so interesting. It's so typical of Apple, it seems. But it's also it's brilliant because, I mean, these top 100 people are the most probably sought after employees in the whole company. Right. And these are the. These are the, the rock stars, the rock stars, rock stars. And I'm sure, and, and please tell us, bringing these guys in only deepened, you know, that loyalty, them, him showing them the iPod before everyone else or showing them the iPad or whatever he showed them. I mean, that had to create just so much more loyalty amongst those, those top, top tier AAA guys. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, one comment I got, if you were in the audience, you, you considered it a privilege. If you were asked to present, you considered it terrifying uh, because the, the presentations had to be the same quality as what Steve Jobs would do for a, for a public keynote. So, um, but yeah, I think, you know, you, this, people had a, a metaphorical gold star on, or gold, you know, gold leaf on their, on their lapel for attending a top 100. 
You talk about the a lot about the culture in the book, and 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 we've talked a little bit about it tonight. One thing that I thought was fascinating was how you talked about how work at Apple work is is basically life, right? When you come back from the weekend, it seems there's no standing around the water cooler and talking about what you did. It's very much it's business uh, all the time, you know, every time. Right. And, and these are you know these are some of these are anecdotes and they, they they become generalizations that by and large when I talk to Apple people nobody challenges me on and so the the high the the the, the high level takeaway is that that Apple unlike certain other companies doesn't approach work to be a subject of play you know they they don't feel that they need to entertain their employees they think work is serious stuff that doesn't mean that it needs to be drudgery that doesn't mean that it needs to be painful but it's not um it's not to be confused with your social life yeah you're, you're here to accomplish something very important and we don't have a lot of time so let's not waste it talking about things that aren't germane yeah well uh, talk to, talk to us a little bit about um we'll talk about focus um, especially as it relates, you know, startups. This is one of my, you know, my favorite takeaways from Steve Jobs as a founder, is is just the incredible focus that he had, and he, you know, really directed the company with. Um, we uh, this afternoon I was talking to Francisco, who's our community manager, and he was he said, you know, I vividly remember the experience of opening my first iPod, and that that that's had a, just an incredible impression on him. The packaging, how he felt, yeah. how it looked. Where did that focus uh, in design? Uh, come from at Apple? Was it there at the beginning? Did it come when Steve came back? So I'm um, I'm purposely not an expert on the pre-1997 mm-hmm. era. I cover it a little bit in the book, but I decided if I was going to write about how Apple works that I was going to focus professionally on the 1997 forward period. So I don't know where the focus came from. You know, from my reading, there was there was certainly... Uh, this uh, this attention to detail and attention to design from almost from the very very beginning you know from the Apple II and certainly with the with the first Macintosh and David Kelly at IDEO tells the story about getting a call at three in the morning from from Steve wanting to argue about the composition of the screws on the inside of the original Macintosh and you know this has become a metaphor for his obsession with things that you not with not only the things that you could see but the things that you couldn't see and i write in the book about the attention that apple gives to oops, to the um to, to packaging design which you know like most people think oh well, that's like you know number 17 on the that's list the of important thing things do. to deal yeah. with and they take it very seriously because we all remember opening the box and seeing the the, the device placed beautifully inside and you know and so on so um this notion of focus and simplicity is what, what's so fascinating to me about Apple is that it's not any one thing. It's not just some, you know, focus on the features in a product. It's focus on, well, we're not going to get into too many products. We're not going to get into too many verticals. We're not going to get into, it's, it's um, really interesting to me, I don't think it's been discussed enough that Apple, this giant company, is extremely headquarters centric around Cupertino. They don't have regional offices. Yes, they have retail stores. Yes, they have these you know these uh, these factory relationships in China. But the important meetings take place Decisions are made in here. Cupertino, face to face. The same way that I read a, pa- a physical newspaper in the morning, Apple people talk to each other to to do the important work of Apple. It's not, I mean, it's not to say that it doesn't happen, but it's not a video conferencing culture. It's not a teleconference culture and so on. It's not a uh, commute from, it's not a um, virtual commuting culture either. Would you tell the story about uh, about Yahoo, about his, uh, sure. this is a really, really interesting story. Sure. And, th- and, and this story in my book uh, had been told before, um, to be clear. But uh, in, you, m- you have to help me, it was 2007, I think, uh-huh. right? Uh, the year that Jerry Yang uh, became interim CEO of, of Yahoo again, or maybe he, I think he was interim first and then he became uh, Came per- back. permanent for yeah. a while. And um, he invited Steve Jobs to speak to a group of 150 or so top Yahoo executives, and uh, they were having an offsite at the 
I want to say the Sofitel in Redwood Shores, and uh, it's, you know, essentially they got the question. He got, they asked Steve Jobs the question that Yahoo was asking everybody and still is, which is, you know, what should we do? And he said, I can't tell you what to do, but I can tell you how we thought about what we did when I came back to the company in 1997. And putting it simply, we asked, what are we good at? And I knew the answer. We were good at making Macintosh computers. Hmm. So we stopped doing all the other stuff. Did you know that Apple made a digital camera in 1997? Hmm. I can't remember what it was called, but they were selling a digital camera. And they were also selling printers and the Newton sure. and many different SKUs of computers. And Jobs said, you know, we're going to make two desktops and two laptops for the time being. This was before the iMac. And actually, he, the way I tell the story, he did say to the Yahoo people, I know which I know what which I, would I would choose, do. but I, I'm not going to tell you. That's that's your that's your problem. And I and I think he didn't tell him for a reason because he was teaching a lesson about, you know, his his approach to running a company, his approach to entrepreneurialism, which was and it's cliche, except they did it at Apple, which is know what you're good at, do that, focus obsessively on it and and work really hard to not do all that other crap that you're not good at and by the way work really hard not to do even things you are good at at the expense of the things that are the most important things do you think that ability and, and a lot of that a lot of that came from or the the result of that was a lot of no's right i mean he yes. was saying no to a lot of things he was cutting things do you feel like that that culture of saying no and the ability to focus was it was it the majority of it driven by Steve, or has that permeated through the rest of the executives in the company? Well, those are two questions, and I think the answer to both is yes. That this was this did come from Steve, as far as I can tell. This was his, his this was his concept, and he inculcated that into the culture of Apple. So you know, Tim Cook references this every 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 public uh, speech that he makes that. We're going to continue to say no to things that that, that, that we don't have the, the time or the ability or, or whatever or what have you to do. So, yeah, I think it is part of the Apple culture. That doesn't mean they're going to be able to execute it without him, but I think they'll continue to try to think that way. T talk, tell us about, uh, this is a, a great line in the book, where you talk about a Apple employees that they almost act like uh, – wealthy teenage or, or, or children teenagers of wealthy yeah of wealthy people so you're referring to a part where i describe the ways that apple despite its size and success is able to emulate a startup selectively so it will create a physical area where a special project is is going on and work in in sort of ways like you know physically and emotionally to separate the people working on that project from the rest of the company. Now again, not a new concept in Silicon Valley. There was the skunk, there were skunk works and other names for this type of thing, but but the 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 metaphor that I'm using is it's a it's a young product. It's it's not necessarily young people, but it's young in the sense that it's immature, it's nascent. And I said there's there's these are like uh these are like, you know, rich kids because they don't have the baggage of, of life and of a larger organization, um, but they do have access to the resources of very rich parents, in this case, Apple's $110 billion balance sheet. What startups that you see right now uh, sort of emulate Apple's culture and what, what Apple, you know, what Apple did? Are there any? Uh, well, rather than, I mean, the, the I'm uh, I'm often really deficient in my knowledge of, of Silicon Valley startups because I don't have the time to pay attention to many of them. And you know, I think to be an expert on startups, you have to sort of you have to you have to at least approach having an encyclopedic knowledge of, of what's going on the way a venture capitalist would, for for example. So, but I'll tell you about some that I've written about. Um, because there's some that are being obvious about it. So two that come to mind are, well, one is Square, which has hired a lot of Apple people. Jack Dorsey didn't work at Square, but he's made no... Um, at Apple. He didn't, thank you. He didn't work at Apple, but he's, he's made no secret of the fact that he emulates uh, and revered Steve Jobs. And so, you know, he's doing two jobs and he's... He's doing keynotes. He's doing keynotes and the... Um, the design of the device is, 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 is you know, overtly Apple-like. So, you know, that's one example. Um, my, my favorite example, and it's a different story, it's a, and it's a controversial topic, which is 
people have asked the question, well, why are there so few Apple exec former Apple executives out there in the world running companies? And I've got a bunch of reasons why. We can talk about it if you like. One that is that is happening is is Nest, which is run by Tony Fidel, who was a senior Apple executive. And the you know the Nest device, the smart thermostat. If you haven't seen it, you know looks like it could easily fit in an Apple store. Um, I, I have a little section on on Nest and Tony in the book, and Tony was really interesting. He shared with me his thinking at this stage of his company's career life, which is I think two years old. What he's trying to take from Apple and what he isn't. Mm -hmm. What he's trying to take is this design aesthetic, this focus on the customer, this willingness to spend money on things that are really important to serve the product, to serve the customer. What he's not taking, you know, he, he, he makes a very good observation that's important to this group of people who think that they have to, to have Apple's success, they have to be just like Steve. Hmm. So Apple's very difficult with the press, they don't, they don't speak freely. That wasn't always the case. The, the, years ago, Steve did speak very freely and, and sought a he lot of publicity. sought after covers, right? Yeah. Um, and so Tony's out there talking to the press, telling Nest's uh, story. And he's also humbler with uh, their channel partners, Best Buy, for example. You know, he doesn't come right out and say this, but he basically implies, you know, we don't, we don't tell Best Buy what to do the way Apple does mm -hmm. um, because we're a lot younger and, and humbler. And, and, and his line is he likens his company to where Apple was with the iPod in, in 2001, 2002. Uh, looking a little bit at the psychology of, of, of Steve Jobs and as it, you know. This is your shout out to the psychology my, club this members. This is the psychology mm -hmm. club right here. Um, and, and, and a big, big uh, thanks to Jenny, who we're going to bring up at the end, who, who really uh, spearheaded uh, uh, getting Adam here. And, and, uh, but what, what, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, this, this idea when, they, when, when sometimes when the, when the employees would meet with Steve, you know, he's legendary for just, you know, berating people and just kind of ripping into them for the sake of, uh, he kind of puts it, for the sake of the product. And um, did that, uh, I mean, I can read your exact line here that you said, there's a mentality that it's okay to shred somebody in the spirit of making the best products. And, and how do you think, do you think this, did this affect job performance? Did this affect, that was the effect positive, completely positive? And, I, and I'd say post-1997, we don't need to go into yeah. the past, but post-1997, was that, uh, was that in the end a positive thing for the company? Well, so first of all, the, the passage you read wasn't about jobs. It's about the it's, it's about the the corporate culture. It's about the behavior generally, not not specifically. And you know, was it successful? I I think there's there's plenty of um, there's there's only evidence to suggest that it has been successful. So yeah. you know the the question in, in a variety of measures, whether it's market capitalization, profits, number of units sold, leadership in markets, it's 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 been almost completely successful. So the question has become: Are are is it sustainable? Did they succeed because of this behavior or in spite of this? behavior because perfectly reasonable people will find this type of behavior repugnant sure you know um uh you know someone said to me i have a five-year-old daughter and someone said to me how would you feel if when she grows up she went to work at apple and um people assume i'm gonna say oh god that i would i wouldn't want that and i don't think anything of the sort if if it was her dream to work in that environment to create those types of things i'd say to i'm so proud of you and so I, I think we all make trade-offs in our careers and our lives. And if, if, if Apple people view it as a trade-off that you're going to be on the receiving end of a really unpleasant conversation for a variety of reasons, and, and the flip side of that is I'm going to contribute to greatness, then you know I, I'm not judging that, that decision on their part. But you raised something interesting. I mean, yeah, I've, I'm told the conversations get nasty and they get personal uh, and, and, and even petty, but the way the arguments are won is on what's best for the product, what's best for serving the customer. I, I believe, you know, it sounds corny. I believe Apple really believes that. Mm -hmm. And now, I don't believe that you have to be a jerk to accomplish that. So, in, you know, we, I, as I mentioned, I run a conference. A conference involves making a lot of decisions about what's going what's gonna to go in what slot, who's going to go on stage, who's going to get to moderate it. And we disagree all the time, and we bend over backwards to disagree um, amicably and uh, respectfully. I think we're really successful at it. Well, you—I mean, so so like you say, it was, it was successful 
from a market cap perspective. It was successful from a product perspective. What about from a people perspective? You t- you spoke with these people. They gave you you know, you know, you had all all these sources telling you the the truth. Did did it affect these people in in negative ways? Did it affect them in positive? You know, it affected their work yeah. in positive ways. But but sure. personally, w- yeah. Well, there's a f- there's a few issues here, and I don't write this in the book, but anecdotally, you hear about um, Apple people being under. A, uh, just a severe amount of stress, and in some cases, debilitating amount, amount of stress. And, and these are generalizations, and so they don't apply everywhere, and it, it varies by job function and by level. Um, uh, but, th- but these are, you know, these are anecdotes, and it's not the only company where people are, are under a ton of stress, but it, it is a place where, um, where you're expected to give your all and again, that's cliche in a lot of places, but at Apple, they mean it. Uh, they they use it in this in their in the in a little handout that they give on this on this new employee orientation. They they say something along the lines of you you can expect to do your life's best work here, but you're going to be swimming in the deep end. This is mm. the place where you're going to want to work weekends because it's that hard. Mm. You're going to be out of your comfort zone. Um, so I think I veered away a little bit from your question. You know, does it does it affect people, right? Um, yeah, but then people and but they have incredible longevity too, and not just at the top, but at all levels of the organization. People tend to stick around for a really long time. I'll give you a, a slightly different uh, observation that you that you didn't ask, but another fascinating characteristic of the the psychological culture of Apple is that it is understood. Not only do you keep secrets, but that you're going to devote all your time and energy to Apple at work, to, to Apple. Oh. Sure. And that none of this brand of you bullshit that you know is 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 so popular. It's the brand of Apple. Full stop. You don't like that? You don't have to work here. Um, now, one of the it's it's obvious why that's good for shareholders and why that's good for customers, and why it's good for the company. Um, but I have heard people say, you know, how having said that, I toiled for all these years and I came out and nobody knew who the hell I was. Right. I think on balance it's working out pretty well because I may not know who the hell you are, but I know you worked at Apple for 10 years and you couldn't be a moron if you worked at Apple for 10 years. Or I know That's what my you assumption. Worked on. I've, used your pro- I've, used, yeah. I've used your work. So again, trade-offs. Okay. Tuck, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, just talking about the future of Apple and, and – uh, you were uh, you just heard Tim Cook speak, and you've just written about them recently. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, his role going forward in terms of, uh, you know, is he there to stay? Is he, uh, you know, uh, you talked about this where he's he's got a ten year, you know, uh, stock vest. Yeah. Um, is you know the way things have gone the last six or eight months, you know, do you has it gone great? Has it gone as expected? What is your what's your take? So I you know first of all it's. By any reasonable measure, it's too early to tell. And uh, in the book, I, I say, you know, Tim Cook may be a caretaker CEO of Apple, but it could be a very long caretaker period. Yeah. And um, and I mean that. I, I think he's a, um, as far as I can tell, he's, you know, he, he may be the CEO that Apple needs right now. This is a big company with a lot of complex That's a great point. Um, uh, operations and, and, and things going on, and he's somebody who's on top of that. Let me tell you about the exchange that I had with him at, at, the, at the All Things D conference last week It was because it, you know, it was fascinating and, and, uh, and entertaining as well. I stepped up to the microphone and, and, and identified myself, and then I said, it's nice to be able to ask you a question, Tim, because I hadn't <laughs> had that opportunity yet. And I asked him what his strengths and weaknesses were as a CEO and as a person, and uh, he didn't. He declined to answer my question. Wow. At first, he said, "Well, I think you could answer that question." And I basically, <laughs> without saying, I sort of stepped back from the microphone. And my attitude was, "Well, I know I could answer that question. I have answered it, but I want you to answer it." Mm-hmm. So he didn't. And then uh, there was this pause, and, and Walt Mossberg and Kara Swisher seemed content for the moment to let me to conti- let me continue to, to do the interview. So I continued, and I said, "All right, um, we know that Steve Jobs paid a lot of attention to design and marketing. Are you paying that kind of attention to design and marketing?" So I'm getting around to answering your question, and you know, he gave me, if you look at his exact words, which I haven't gone back and done yet, he gave a sort of a thoughtful answer. He said, "Well, Steve spent." considerably all of his time on those two areas and I'm spending my time on all the areas that are that are of interest to the company. Mm-hmm. Now, 
that's exactly what those of us looking in from the outside um, expected. That's what we suspected was that he was not going to have the same focus on design and mar- marketing as Steve Jobs had had. But you know, he 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 gave some color on that. So you know, if there, I have no evidence that he's not going to be the CEO for the foreseeable future. What, what when do you think Apple will have its first real post Steve Jobs test? Uh, at what point? Uh, at what point does the caretaking? Uh, you know, do you, is it is it to when they introduce a new product? Is it you know as, as as the tablet market evolves? What do you think it is? Well. Yeah, we're we're, we're going to need like true insider knowledge to comment on. There's a very small handful of people will be able to say, well, this product Steve had no influence on, mm. and that's you're going to have to have great insider knowledge to be able to speak authoritatively on that because Apple plans really far ahead. They work on things for a long time. Some of those things never see the light of day, and so Steve Jobs would have been aware of things that were in the works for a very long time. Having said that, you know when 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 Apple comes out with its with its first, you know, revolutionary product, its next revolutionary product, and I would say the last revolutionary product was the iPad, and the one before that was the iPhone. When they come out with their next revolutionary product, we'll be able to judge the, we'll be able to judge we'll be able to begin to judge the new regime. It, you know, I don't think the same was true for the iPhone 4S or for the yeah, uh, sure. or for the new iPad. Um, w- the current iPad, I think, we'll just start saying. And and do you, do you th- do you believe that? I mean, you do you believe that that product line this, that product line is that something that? Uh, I mean, do you th- Steve may have you know? Do you believe he had specific you know? products in mind that you know that may go the, for the next five or ten years or beyond or well let me uh, let me share like another um and this isn't in my book but it's it's it's, keep, it's becoming clearer to me the, the language at apple is very important and one of the words that apple uses to describe the um to describe itself is they the apple people talk about the cadence of apple apple has a cadence to it and so we see that cadence from the now predictable schedule of, of product announcements, right? So we'll see one that we'll see something next week at the Worldwide Developers Conference. We'll see something at a at an event at a music event in September or a Mac event in October. And, and there was an iPad event in March, and they they mix it up a little, but they they sort of that that's the template. But but behind the scenes, there's a cadence going on where they are working on things with a very detailed plan, a written down plan, and they know what the plan is. And that's not to say that they don't deviate from the plan they do, but sure, you know, and Steve Jobs intimated to Walter Isaacson that we've got this TV thing figured, and so everybody thinks they know what that means, but they don't know what that means. It could mean several things. And that's, and that's where, so, so to an extent, yes, uh, he would have been knowledgeable about many of the things that, that are coming, but the other thing is that he was famous for changing what was coming hmm. um, based on what he was saw. He would say, okay, we're not going to do that. Or we are going to do this. Well, if they continue to operate that way, then the, manage- the current management team will, will make changes that, that, they that he yeah. wouldn't have foreseen. Do you, um, and this is the last question, we'll open it up to everyone else. In, the, in the, you know, this time that Steve has left, have you seen um, any of the, you know, from uh, the internal people, is is there any, uh, is this magic that Apple has had six or eight months ago, is it just as strong? Is there any evidence that it's less strong or that? Um, I don't have any. Um, has the fairy any, dust, has the fairy dust, you know, left? Yeah, I don't have, ev- I don't personally have any evidence one way or the other. And, um, but, but other, you know, uh, some people do, right? Some people have opinions. And, um my in my experience you have to take those opinions with a grain of salt some of them may be very good observations some of them may be garbage observations because this company is under so much scrutiny that you know i'm i'm struggling for metaphors but people you know it's it's like a they're like a, a painting that's a masterpiece and people are analyzing you know every little brush stroke 
is there a fleck of dust under that brush stroke where the artist didn't smooth it out properly? That's the level of, of scrutiny, and some of it's important and some of it isn't. Yeah. So, for example, you know, I'll give you like a, a superficial example that people are talking about very seriously. Uh, was it a good idea or a bad idea to to go the direction of marketing the iPad more like the iMac? They don't have the iMac 4, the iMac 5, the iMac 7. They have the iMac. And when they come out with a new iMac, it's the iMac. But that isn't the naming scheme that they take for the uh, for the iPhone. Was it, a, was it the right move or the wrong move to call it the iPad instead of the iPad 3? Well... We know when Steve was alive, they called it. They called the second generation the iPad 2. It's and it's, so it's this sort of thing that that the, the people who care and it's a lot of people debate ad nauseum. Is it an important debate? I don't know. You don't have a, you don't have an opinion on it. I I I don't yet. You know. And so um, was Tim Cook less charismatic and entertaining and um, you know brilliant on stage than Steve Jobs? Yes. Does that mean there's less magic? Maybe, I'm not sure. Can we give uh, give Adam a big, big, huge round of applause? Thank you. Let's let's take a few questions from the audience, and I'll just walk out here. And why don't you meet me in the middle if you want to come, and we'll get you on tape here properly. So I will back up from the speaker. HP. Did I say latitude? Yeah, yeah I meant HP. I can't remember what. It's an HP. Yeah, yeah. Perfectly good device, by the way, and light. <laughs> Good battery power. Um, I thought your book uh, did an excellent job of showing that Steve Jobs' greatest creation was his company. And then you study the company rather than Steve Jobs. Yes. So I, I don't think anyone else really has that insight. Like everybody's looking to Steve Jobs, the man. And your book actually talks about the company yes, as very the purposely. best, best yeah. mirror of understanding him. And that, that's a great insight. But what I was going to ask is uh, specific to like how Jobs is using Joel Padoni to try and perpetuate the legacy. Have you seen any of the materials that, I mean, he also picked Walter Isaacson as his biographer, so he totally blew that one. And the, the way that inside Apple documents things seems more insightful than what they could actually tell themselves inside the university. Interesting, about. yeah. So I, mean, I, I thank you for your compliments, and I, I agree with a lot of what you said and disagree with some of what, some of what you said. I, I, um, you're right. I, I very consciously made the book about Apple, not about Steve Jobs. And I mean, part of that, let's be honest, he was working with a world-famous historian, and, and I knew there was going to be a, a very comprehensive biography about him, which I think Walter Isaacson achieved, a, a very comprehensive biography. So and that wasn't my topic. My topic was the company. So I tried very hard to make it about the company, which also served to answer this perennial question, what's the difference between Steve Jobs and Apple? I tried to answer that question. I think there is a difference. That's not to deny his centrality to the company over the last 14 and a half years, but to say that there is this thing that, that resulted from his hard work, but also the hard work of many other talented people called Apple. Um, you asked me about Apple University, which is something that, that, he, that Steve Jobs created about four years ago uh, and hired the dean of the Yale School of Management and, uh, to, to, teach, to teach case studies about Apple's decisions and Apple's decision-making processes to Apple's employees, particularly its managers. And, um, you know, it was it was obvious to me that this was an effort um, on Steve Jobs' part to write it down, to write down his techniques, so that you know, almost in a Talmudic sense, so that the, his his followers would be able to understand his techniques when he was gone, and he knew at that point that he was going to be gone. Um, I don't know nearly as much about Apple University as I would as I would like to uh, as, as I would like to know. There are documents. I don't I don't I haven't read them, and um, I don't know that those documents. I I believe those documents are superior to my book. I think they have done a good job of explaining Apple to themselves, and I'd love to read them. And I, I think we all should get it. I, I wish we would all get a chance to read them. I, was, I started to say I think we should. I don't believe that. That's, that's up to them. They do whatever they damn well please with, with, with the course material of, of Apple University. So 
my question for you is the the thing that I love about Apple and that I've always been a fan of is almost um, for lack of a better term Steve Jobs just had balls when it came to setting pace for products and like what he did with Adobe I love absolutely love Adobe in general but I hated flash so as a web designer I thought it was clunky I thought it was heavy and then when he came out and just basically stood his ground against such a huge technology that was permeating the web and it was, it was kind of polluting the web with all these animation and he took took this stand and now you go to HTML5 and and CSS3 and that's their whole push right so I, I love that about Steve Jobs and I love that about Apple um, and I see so many companies sit you know at the startup level the product is great but as as they get higher it's it becomes I mean it becomes a sellout and the, yeah. the consumer ends up paying for it, right? Yeah. So you get these Absolutely. crap products because so-and-so company made a deal with so-and-so company and whatever. So um, d my question for you is, do you see that change? Because like as a consumer, I'd be like super bummed if that changed yeah. at Apple. I understand. You know what I mean? Like, I do. Do you see that happening? Do you see that changing A and then B, do you see other companies taking that same kind of stance? Great, you know, fantastic question, and uh, you know, I, I, you've given me an idea of it. I, I should have had a chapter. Maybe I can write a whole book on the question of ballsiness because I think you put your finger on it, and and so you've also given me an opening because Derek didn't say this. At least I didn't hear him say it. But it, as if people trickle out because maybe they have to go home to their families or something, I know there's going to be a, a raffle of a very small number of books. But I also wanted to tell you that someone's here to to sell you a copy of my book if you want. If you want to buy it, and uh, I just didn't want that to go unsaid because I'll be go ahead and be ballsy too because I'm very proud of my product. Um, thank you. Oh, I was going to say it. Okay, so so let me try to uh, let me try to to you're going to have to remind me one and two, but but I'll I'll, I'll get there in, in a second because I think Apple's ballsiness is one of the great parts of the, of the story, right? Um, they, they do very few things. That's part of the corporate culture. They've made tremendously big, ballsy bets over the years. Uh, you know, now you could say with $110 billion and with the annuity stream of the Macintosh that they can take big bets and it doesn't matter anymore. Even if they fail, they'll be fine. But there was a period with the kind of money that they spent to develop the, the iPhone, for example, where an iPhone failure would have been devastating. It wouldn't have put them out of business, but it would have been really bad. And you can, you can say that about a lot of the major investments that, that Apple has made. I find that tremendously exciting and tremendously, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, attractive. Right, so it's the antithesis of the way the rest of corporate America behaves. I don't know about startups, but the rest of corporate America says we have a fiduciary responsibility to our shareholders to be freaking boring. And we have to spread the risk around with a portfolio of lots of products that we hope won't fail, but we're pretty sure some of them will because, you know, shit happens and products fail, but we, so we better have enough. And we couldn't, we, we, we don't want to try to lose money. And what, ha what happens? Most of them suck. And Apple doesn't suck. Now they could, and you know maybe they'll maybe they'll screw some maybe they'll screw the next rev up, and 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 I think they'll fail. They could fail as a result if they do. I I I, if they had failed over the last 15 years, they would have failed going down with the guns a blazing. Now to get to your question is is will that change? If you, I have a, a a story in the current issue of Fortune where I suggest where I suggest at the margin things already are changing. And at the margin, I want to stress that. I'm not suggesting the magic's gone. But, you know, they, they do have a responsibility. They, they are big. They are more complex than ever. They, they do have a responsibility to make sure that they don't screw things up as best they can. And that is their great challenge, to not screw it up but to be true to themselves, which is to continue to, take, to make big bets because that's what led to their success. Um, did I answer both your questions? Yeah, no, I mean, well, you know, the question is, is there, is there other companies that, that walk the walk as well as they talk the talk about serving the customer as Apple does? And, you know, look, I, I know that, you know, the, the fanboys and fangirls love to pick on the we'll, we'll give you the examples of how apple doesn't serve their customer and and i know about things that aren't as good as they should be and we could all have a you know long conversation over beers about them 
Um, on balance, I think that Apple really does believe that it's serving its customer and it does make decisions. You don't want to get carried away. I mean, some of the things that Steve did, he did for self-serving reasons or out of spite or whatever. But, you know, again, on balance. So do other companies do it? I mean, sure, there's, there's, other, there's, other, good, there's other good companies. Um, but, you know, uh, but, but, you know nothing, nothing comes to mind because I haven't been spending time. You know, two companies I, that I pick on from time to time and a little bit in the book, and it's just sort of brain dead obvious, how they could benefit from being more like Apple. One is Google, which has you know so much going on, but and they've acknowledged this, and they're trying to be more focused. Um, and the other, you know, really obvious one is HP, which is really suffering right now. I think from being neither a great consumer nor a great enterprise company. And um, you know, did Apple get lucky be by focusing on the consumer for the past fifteen years, or did they create their their great fortune by focusing on the consumer for the last 15 years. Yeah, doesn't matter. But the reason they're a $600 billion market cap company or, or whatever it is today is because of that focus. Okay, we'll do one more. So Steve had this habit of saying no at the last moment or saying things aren't good enough and the entire organization complete, uh, complied. Who in Apple has <coughs> that kind of power today? I mean, the short answer to your question is I don't know, and this is what I was trying to get at w with Cook. I mean, this is what we this is what we all want to know. So, you have to presume, without any further, without any other knowledge, that that Cook has that power, and so the question becomes, how will he exercise that power if he's not this freakish genius that Steve Jobs was? By the way, I don't know if you noticed, but I, I, I try not to call him Steve because he wasn't a friend of mine. And, and uh, you know, I, I don't want to buy into that, the Apple behavior of referring to him as Steve because I'm not one of them. But um, I think it's safe to assume that Cook is not that same freakish genius. And so I assume he's he thinks of himself more the way a traditional CEO thinks of him or herself, which is I'm the boss. I've got amazing people around me. I'm going to listen to what they have to say, and that, and I'm going to make the decision. That's what Steve Jobs did too, by the way. And and he, you know, he wouldn't always acknowledge it, but he absolutely deferred to the people who knew more about things than he did. Uh, he would then act as if he knew what 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 they knew, but that was his process uh, as well in terms of decision making. There's anecdotal evidence that decisions are getting made more slowly at Apple and I don't know if that anecdotal evidence is uh, you know is a is a fair generalization or if it's you know marginal